Hi, Kylie. Welcome to Triggered to Life podcast. I'm so excited to have you on and so grateful uh, to have you on the show. How are you? I'm lovely. So with you and have this beautiful conversation with your community. Yeah. So let's see. Kylie and I met, well, I don't know if you remember me, but I went to Mark's um, uh, conference in Vancouver and you were one of the speakers. And I think it was five years, almost five years ago now. Um, and I just remember you speaking and me being like, oh, she's so cool. And then I, I uh, started following you on Instagram and you have a beautiful Instagram account called Being is Beautiful. And so I would love to start there and hear how that came into fruition and, and what kind of sparked that being created. Yeah. I've never been asked that question before, so I really love it. <gasps> um, so being as beautiful dropped into my orbit and awareness when I was 21 years old. It was right after I graduated from university and I was invited to go to a workshop um, on the Enneagram. Okay. Which is that personality system. Yeah. Where it's like one through nine and figure out your Enneagram number and figure out who you are on the planet. And at that time of my life, I was I was really quite confused. Um, and because of that confusion, I really, really wanted to know, like I had this deep ache mm. around the question of like, why am I here? Mm. Like, what am I supposed to do? I always had this deep inner knowing that there was a purpose or reason here on this planet. And it kind of like kept getting louder and louder, especially after I graduated university. Cause I graduated pre-med and business. And I always had the idea in my head to follow in, um, some family footsteps and go into uh, medicine. So healthcare, whether that was a surgeon or a PA assistant, physician's assistant. Um, and all that felt like a no in my body. Mm. And I was like, oh my gosh, if I don't, if it's not that path, then what path is it? Yeah. So anyways, I found myself at a lot of these <laughs> conferences and workshops. I was like, yes, if this is going to tell me anything about who I am and why I'm here, great. So yeah. So I went to that workshop and one of the additional speakers that was present was um, Richard Rohr, who's written a lot of books. I um, love him. Yeah. Richard Rohr did a three-day workshop in Vegas. And I was sitting there at his workshop, just notes, 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 because it was the first time anybody was speaking to something that felt unknown, but known to me. And I really resonated with some of the messages. And one of the things he said was being is beautiful. Mm. And so this is actually, I got to reach out to uh, Richard Warren and be like, yo, I have been utilizing this sentence as like my anchor point wow. ah, since hearing it. So heard it, wrote it down and it became my blog because back then um, when I didn't know what I was here to do, I was like, well, I'm going to just create a blog and talk about health and wellness um, because food was my entry point into this whole conversation today. So I um, had, oh gosh, a myriad of things happening in my physical system when I was out of alignment, like digestive disorders, lower back pain, inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, I lost my vision twice. Like there was like a lot of things that were just like, showing up. And I was like, okay, something's not right here. Yeah. And then that's what opened the door for me to examine and explore uh, the relationship between body and food. And so I, I got really passionate about that and started a blog as being as beautiful. And then it became an Instagram and you know how things go from there. Yeah. The evolution. Of the world. Oh, wow. One thing you said really stood out to me and that was that it was a full body. No. And can you explain what that fe felt like in your body specifically? Uh, so for me, specifically becoming a surgeon, 
I was I shadowed surgeons in the field because that's what you do. If you, mm-hmm. you check it out, you're like, is this something that I want to spend another decade of my life moving into? Yeah. And I remember being in the OR and one, not being able to separate myself from the pain of the patient, which is not necessarily a really good place to be if you can, or if you're a highly sensitive person or <laughs> Catholic, it's like, oh, this is too much. Um, and I started to faint in the OR. <laughs> And I was okay. like, I couldn't handle it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is way too much stimulation yeah. and way too much connection from body to body. So um, the full body no though after was, I mean, I was, I had interviews, I was going forward yeah, and I couldn't sleep, Cami. It was like my whole body, I was in an anxious um, um, response because I was terrified to tell my father because I didn't want to let him down. It was like, I was at that point in my life, what I identified as the perfect daughter, the perfect, like I never upset my father. Yeah. That direction um, shift for me personally. And, um, I had to do it. It was like, my body was not sleeping. I was tossing and turning. It just felt like a density. It felt like, yeah. Yeah. You know, like I wasn't amplified on it. I wasn't excited. I was like, this is the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wonder how many people push through that and, and keep going and, and then end up, well, it sounds like your body was telling you. I, you know, it's so interesting. I find that for me, when I examine my timeline of my life from like Genesis to now, Mm -hmm. my body has always been loud. Mm. Like it is, it's actually quite wild. And I'm actually historically really upset and frustrated with my body about that because I'm like, why can't I just feel good? And like, and it's like, no, something's not right. Or it's not in alignment or you got to dig deeper. or You got to do this work. And I'm like, Oh, so it's like both a blessing and a curse, but obviously at the end of the day, it's the biggest blessing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I so resonate with that. It's like, for a long time, I had the perfect diet and the perfect exercise routine, but the thoughts I was thinking were just garbage. And like your body can't heal when you're holding trauma and you have negative thought loops just constantly going. And yeah, so I I, I feel you on that because I, I felt that frustration before and it's like, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. And I think under, I think women specifically, and I, I'm just going to speak to to women because in my experience and it's my understand and relate to is we usually take the symptoms or things that are happening in our bodies and, and make it mean that there's something wrong with us. I mean, marketed that way all day long is we're broken. We need to be fixed. We need to do this. We need to do that. And I'm at this point in my life after being stuck in that loop for yeah. seven years of self-shaming and self-blaming that I'm broken and there's something wrong with me that I'm finally, luckily, gratefully (laughs) coming to a place where I'm like, I'm not broken. My body is wise and it's speaking to me and it needs to be privileged over everything. Mm. And that was the most liberating choice point in my life where instead of gaslighting myself, instead of minimizing, instead of like blaming and shaming, I was like, no, my body's, my body's intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. The body knows exactly how to heal just have to give it the right things you just have to listen right Mm -hmm. wow i love that um i also realized i didn't introduce you (laughs) and you you deserve a very vibrant introduction which is you are um a plethora of different you wear you have a, you wear a plethora of different hats, but you're a certified health coach. You're an emotional expert. You're the co-founder of Zura Health. You also have your own podcast. You're a speaker and a writer. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with you in creating a no man container, which we'll get into. But I just wanted to um, introduce you because you are so special and. And I feel like you're the type of person that follows the current. And so you may have been those things in the past. You may be going along the current to become other things in the future. But for now, that's that's a part of who you've been and where you're going. 
Yeah, I appreciate that yeah. caveat. <laughs> yeah. as, as somebody who's constantly following the current and going deeper into myself and the layers of yeah. why I'm here, I can't stand bios because I'm like, wait, that's so limited. But I get that we have to use those um, yeah. in this world to, to kind of register. But yes, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah and I encourage everyone to go and, and check check your work out because um, there are so many nuances to what you do and it's beautiful. And that's really what makes you so special. Mm, thanks, Cammie. Yeah. I see that fully. Mm. Um, so you've always been drawn to self-development of some sort in a way. And what was the first moment you realized like, I'm a little, I'm interested in this. I want to explore self more hmm. oh my gosh which which moment is the moment right it's like yeah. i feel like my whole life has been around that deep inquiry i'm a very contemplative person hmm. um, and i spend a lot of time in solitude and i'm very attracted to ancient tradition world religions and spirituality from hmm. from various angles and i think that really the source of that is that ache again of like the purpose what's my purpose for being here there's more there's more to this story of being a human other than what has been imprinted and or is being modeled currently for me in this system and so for me though when i really examine the timeline of my life i'd say the biggest pivot moment to go deeper into self happened around 24 when mm -hmm. I got divorced and that moment in my life was kind of the, the moment where it was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> who the heck are you? How did we get here? And how do we never make it back here again? Because I was mm -hmm. in so much pain and it, it's like in a blink of an eye, but not such a blink um, over the course of a month or so. It was like everything that I thought my life was and where it was going completely dissolved out of thin air. And mm -hmm. from that blank slate, I was like, okay, we got to go a little deeper here. Yeah. We got to really figure out why we're here and what's happening <laughs> so that we can kind of step into deeper alignment so we could prevent um, following autopilot, following patterns of, yeah, that old, outdated, and, and not necessarily fulfillment. So mm. that was a big moment for me. And many moments after. Yeah. And 20, 24 is, is, is young. What, when, how old are you when you got married? I was 22 when I got married. I got engaged at 21. Because I was so lost at 21 and like in the unknown of like who I am and what I'm here to do, I pivoted into something very familiar, which was relationships. Like, okay, mm -hmm. well, if I don't know why I'm here or what I'm supposed to do. I'm just going to pivot into a familiar lane and get married and play housewife and follow that path because that's something that seems modeled and the path that a lot of women in my family system have taken. So I'm just going to go that route because if I go that route, then it's a detour from actually asking the deeper question mm. for, for some time. And don't get me wrong. There was love there. And my ex-husband is an incredible human being and it was all perfect and divine and exactly yeah. how it needs to be. Mm, I love that. Um, even back then, did you, were you some, I mean, you said at 21, you were doing this any Enneagram workshop, like based on who you were back then versus who you are now, were there any overlapping core values that you feel like you've just had the entire time, like your entire life that were just part of your blueprint? Absolutely. I'd say one of my core values is freedom liberation, mm. adventure, and, um, and life really like, I want to be alive. Like that's a core value. Like, yeah. The core value. I don't know why, but that feels really resonant right now. Like I came here to live, not to fall asleep and, and not be present to my reality and my internal and external reality. So I think the whole time those have been with me and yeah they, those values are the foundation in which I walk upon. Mm. And I've always, my father will tell you, he's like, 
I can tell you to do this or follow that path and, you know, learn this lesson. But he's like, you're going to touch the stove, Kai. Like, that's just who you are. You are going to figure it out for yourself. And I'm like, thank you. You're right. Like, I will not, I'm very like sovereignty. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sovereignty and collective liberation are very similar things Mm -hmm. to me. But like, for me, being a sovereign being and being, having agency in my life has also been of really strong core value. So Mm -hmm. um, whenever I feel trapped or like I'm lacking agency or sovereignty in my life, I definitely bump up against that edge. Like, okay, what's here? Let me get out of this. Um, And then I look for that. (laughs) But yeah. Yeah. It's those the things that have followed me. (laughs) Yeah. It's cool because when you have that, um, when you have those core values and then you begin to bump up against them, it's almost like it, you can use it as a compass. So you know, if something is in alignment or if something feels like Ooh, this right. needs to shift. Yeah, absolutely. I love um, edges. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, it's a good way to keep growing. <laughs> always. Always. I hope it never ends. You know, I think for a yeah. long time, my life I really wanted to get to the place where everything was figured out it was like okay we're clear we, and I've in my maturation if you will um I've gotten to a place where I don't know everything I don't want to know everything and if anything I actually know less and I'm more open to the mystery and that feels really liberating where historically mm-hmm. liberation was being sourced through control of managing mm-hmm. my external environment and now liberation is sourced through surrender and receptivity and um what a beautiful shift yeah wow i i love that um so you 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 speak to this or you've spoken about this to me and i don't think a lot of i don't i don't know if everyone understands uh feminine energy versus masculine energy and i was wondering if you could explain that to the audience yeah so there's a lot of literature on this, and I, I and I haven't spent actually a lot of time. But as as I kind of do more of my work and and more of my purpose is revealed to me at this time, um, I am here as a steward and protector of the feminine principle, and mm. what that act, what that means to me. So for, for feminine energy, feminine principle, what that means to me is body, flesh, soul, mother, Mm -hmm. earth, sustainability, um, sensuality, sexuality, Mm -hmm. uh, being like in our beingness, uh, solitude, reflection, non-rational realms. So like, um, visioning, Mm -hmm. uh, creativity, like all of those are part of the creation, those are part of the feminine principle for me. Mm. The masculine principle is, it's a beautiful principle that has been deeply distorted. Both of them have under the colonial capitalist patriarchy that we've been living in for thousands of years. And I'd say that the masculine principle in its essence is, is the action, is the protection, is the structure, is the container, is, is the embodied sense of safety, is, Mm. um, is it's what listens to the feminine principle and makes it happen Mm. and like it's the deep honoring the deep reverence for life um Mm. by showing up and modeling and like being in that so it's like the the action it's like one of the beautiful ways of describing it that i've heard and i believe this is from Dr. Clarissa Pinkola Estes and women who run with wolves is almost thinking like the masculine is the riverbank and Mm -hmm. the feminine is the flow. Mm. And so the masculine really creates that safe container. Yeah. So it's like boundaries. It's, it's like the action that creates the structure and container. So um, that's how I relate to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the distorted masculine um, right now, currently on this planet looks like domination, control, mm-hmm. Uh, the degradation, exploitation, and extraction of the feminine principle. And um, that's why I think we have a lot of work to do is to examine how, how our own inner masculine treats our own inner feminine. Mm. So I also forgot to mention that the inner masculine is like linear logic, like mind. That's yeah. very masculine. 
right? And the feminine being more intuitive, instinctual, non-rational. Mm. Um, and, and for me, a big kind of aha moment around this piece was, was projecting a lot of or, a, or the external systems that we live in and how the feminine has been treated on this planet. And then I yeah. sat back and I'm oh my gosh, I do it to myself. Like I have an inner paper that's in here, shaming, blaming, telling me I'm too much, telling me my, like gaslighting my own instinct and intuition gas. Like it was just like, oh, I actually have to go in to, to, to heal this fracture before yeah. I can even expect it to be healed in the world around me or in my close relationships. So that was, that was fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I definitely want to get into that a little bit because um, I, well, from what you've explained, the no man container to me as is like, yes, you are observing all of those, all that dialogue, that masculine, you know, thought process. Right. And that is affected by, from the patriarchy, right? Like we take on those beliefs because they exist in our society. So can you tell us a little bit about the no man container who introduced you to that and um, <laughs> why it was kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love this story so much. So 2019, I was coming out of a four, four year relationship. And in that relationship, I, <laughs> I fell into the tra the deepest, darkest trauma vortex I had ever been in, in my life. And my life force was being sucked. Like I was mm -hmm. just like, I, it, it was a life or death choice for me. It was like, you either stay and you die or you, and I'm not kidding. Like I'm actually yeah. very serious about that. And, or you choose to live and you release mm -hmm. attachment. And obviously I chose to live. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Support. Thank you. and and after that that rupture really sent me on a deep descent into my own internal world and examining what was in the way of me being able to say yes. What was the way of me being able to step forward into deep sacred union? Um, and and I think a lot that. Um, that unconsciously is in the way of our relationships that we don't even know is there. So um, anyways, of course, when you're in a descent, you're like, okay, who's going to help me find a way out of this? Like, yeah. Where are my teachers? Where are my guides? What, what do I need to do in order to complete this initiation so that I can actually cross this threshold into a mature, competent um, woman? Because that's kind of what I, Historically, I'd felt like a little girl in my relational dynamics, and I'd recreate this mother, um, man, man, child, or project father, or project mother onto my partner, and yeah. I'd stay in the. I'm a broken little girl who's incompetent and incapable of standing on my own two feet. Mm. So, I was really seeking that support, and one of mentors who entered into my orbit was uh, Mark Woolen, who is the author of "It's Not Always About You." Um, and he, his work is all about examining family constellations. So looking at intergenerational patterns that have been passed down to you and that might be blocking you from seeing or from, um, might be blocking you from stepping into or wow. forward in your life in many various ways. So I get on a call with him and right before the call, I'm like, I don't know why I'm getting on this call. Like I've already done so much work. Like I'm good legit cammy 10 minutes into the call. I'm like crumbling because I've never felt so seen in my life. He had literally picked apart a whole constellation, my whole being in 10 minutes. And I was like, is it really that obvious? Like for real, it's really that obvious. And what he said to me was that my core organizational pattern of how I orient in relationship was based off of my core attachment blueprint with my mother. Mm. And because of my birth trauma and because of the matrilineal trauma down my line, mm -hmm. I was in a core pattern of organization where I would actually, in leaving my being, jumping into my mother's orbit, trying to manage and understand what it is that she needs in order for me to get my needs met. Really, it was just a way to um, cultivate and source safety by mm -hmm. 
if I make mom okay, then I'm going to be okay. And so I would psychically and intuitively jump out of my internal reality, jump into mom's and at the expense of my own needs, at the expense of my own emotions, at the expense of really me, to be honest with you, because that's what I needed to do at that time in order to sort of safety. And, and then he was like, so um, there's that piece. And then man is mother. And it he said that to me. And he's like, so you're just re- recreating your dynamic with mother with all the men in your life. And I was like, okay, so <laughs> that's cool, Mark. Like, Mark Wolin. I was like, that's cool. Um, well, that's really, that, like, I, I literally it hit me like a freaking freight train because I'd never seen it before. Like, it was like, what? how could I? This is like such a basic core pattern. How did I miss it? And in examining my previous, this is <laughs> that this is this is how I've lived all of my life, and I've been playing out this pattern in all my relational dynamics. And yeah, it really hit me. It stopped me dead in my tracks. And basically, what he said was, "If you don't do this work, create the container to remove the masculine or men out of your life, I will be on the same call with you in two years." And I was like, "Okay." And he was like, cause you're probably already talking to people and pulling them close. And he's like, you don't know the difference between true love and, and addiction and like the high you're getting from this closeness. And he's like, and really this core pattern of intuiting their needs, pulling them closer and making them feel good is an addictive pattern that prevents mm-hmm. you from actually examining and getting to the root of your own grief, your own loneliness, your own, um, um, yeah, your own death of sadness from your core relationship with mother. And so in order to break that, you need to create a container and you Mm. need to remove it because you're sourcing so much from it. And um, if you don't, then I'll see you in two years. And I was like, (laughs) okay, well, if you know anything about me, I don't want to recreate anything because that just sounds like a nightmare. Uh, So I was like, okay, well, I'll create it. And luckily, like, I started like literally the next day. I was like, okay, we're creating a, a, a container where I'm removing the masculine. And then somebody, I was talking to a girlfriend and she's like, oh, have you heard of Kendra Kunov? She has a container called mm. the Nomad Diet. And I was like, what? I was like, never even heard of it. Um, she's like, yeah. And I looked her up. It was starting in January and this was happening in November. And so I started my Nomad Diet based off of the the, the parameters that Mark Wolin gave me. And then I yeah. entered into a container with Kendra and like 50 other women um, mm. to also create more accountability and more support. Because for me, choosing that was actually like in the moments that I chose that for myself and my soul chose it, my whole nervous system went into full activation. There were mm. parts of me that were like, you're going to die. Like you're not actually going to survive. You're not capable. You're incompetent. And I had to sit with all that. Like I was like, oh my God, where's all this coming from? Because you don't, you're not consciously aware of it, but they were patterned so deeply ingrained in my being that only in creating the container was I able to be met. Was I able to meet these parts, to face these parts, to hold these parts and to integrate them. And Mm -hmm. I had a lot of support um, from, from an, somatic experiencing practitioner. So somebody who works with the nervous system on that foundational level to really support me in integrating and creating enough safety and capacity in my system to be able to step forward into this container in a way that felt, um, I guess, manageable. I mean, I'm going wrong. It wasn't like at times I was like full shit down, like trying to find some regulation because I was, I sourced so much of my regulation from my interaction with men. Mm. Like I was regulating my nervous system through those connections instead mm-hmm. of actually self-regulating because I didn't have that. I didn't have that emotional capacity because it had never been modeled. Remember? Cause I'm leaving my internal system and managing yeah. my mother instead of actually learning the opposite of like how to manage my experience because she never learned, you know, right. The, yeah. this is the old, old pattern that kind of carries through our lineage. So that was the creation of that. <sighs> Wow. So I'm curious because as you change, did you force, does your mom like energetically have to change because you are no longer supporting her emotions? Oh, what a good question. Um, 
you know, there's so much here in this conversation that has to do with mother and the mother wound and what I have traveled through our matrilineal lines between mother and daughter. So for me, as I started to step into more sovereignty um, and started to step into more agency, I actually was triggering unconscious rage and grief that my mother didn't even know was there mm. from not necessarily having choice or agency in the way that I was exerting choice and agency in my life. And because I was the one who looked like the cause of all that pain and unconscious rage, yeah. it was directed at me. And mm. Um, for me at that time, I was working with a psychotherapist. This is before setting the container yeah. of the human diet and the rupture. Um, and he basically said, like, you're at this point in your life where you either choose mom and the relationship you have here, or you choose love. Mm. And he was like, because this is toxic and yeah. this, these can't go together. Yeah. And I was like, uh, you know, little girl, it's like, in like, that's core attachment. That's like, there's no way. Um, yeah. But it was like very clear to me. Like I am willing to lose my mother mm. to protect myself and step forward because what I want is liberated. What I want is healthy relational dynamics. What I want is liberation. What I want is freedom. And, and if I have to lose my mom at the expense of that, that's okay. Mm. Um, luckily, Luckily, and I'm very blessed, and this is not everybody's experience. My mom came along for the ride. My mm. mom has done a lot of work. We have healed our attachment. We have healed our relationship. We've talked about patriarchy. We've talked about her lineage. We've talked about the messaging. We've talked about all of it. And I'm really like, I'm kind of blown away by how much shift when one person chooses to step out of the dynamic and is like, I'm no longer going to relate or play this game in this way. I'm no longer choosing this. Your choice now. You stay there and stay in that or you come along. It's going to hurt because there's a lot there. But yeah. that comfort is liberation if we have the support and tools to move through it. So um, yeah, that's that path specifically between mother and daughter will look different for everyone. Yeah. Um, but for me, it looked gnarly at one point and now it looks like, oh, finally we have a relationship where we're relating adult to adult. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Like I, I, I can imagine that's a really hard decision. It was, but it, but it, again, it was just like life or death. It was like, yeah. you stay enmeshed in this dynamic mother and you stay here forever. Or you break the rule, you break the pattern, you break the cycle and you step forward. And, mm -hmm. and that's the choice. Like, you don't know what's on the other side. I didn't know what was on the other side. Yeah. I had to fully surrender and be like, okay. And I did a lot of work in the, like, I'm such a woo woo person. I love it. And I don't care anymore. Um, when other people think of me, but I was like talking to, listen, I have a purpose for being here. You played a very important role for me on this path, I really want you to come with me because yeah. I love you. And I think you're incredible. Like, and I think you're, you have so much power. So like, I need you to buckle up. Like, yeah. like and, and you know what, Cammy? I don't think I've ever shared this. I had a, and know anything about my story. Most of my story and journey is, um, is seen and related to through dream time for me. So I'm very, mm -hmm much in my dream space. I get a lot of messages, a lot of, a lot of clarity in that space. And I was having a dream where I was carrying my, my mother and she was frail. And, and this was during my no man died container. She was frail and she was like, like bleeding out basically. And I was begging her. I was like, tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. And we're being chased. And I woke up the next morning from this dream, like shook. Cause it was like one of those dreams where like, there's a message here. It's very, very clear. And so yeah. I said, it because at that time my mom and really talking much it was like yeah. very this um but it was it was getting to the point where we were both opening to like have a real conversation about what the heck just happened in the last 18 months um and i sat with that dream 
And it moved a lot out of my system. Like I had to purge energetically. I, I was carrying a lot of shame, um, toxic shame that wasn't mine to carry. Like the belief that I was broken and unlovable coming mm-hmm. from the fact that that the women in my lineage were mother in a way that made them believe they were good or worthy or valuable. So I sat with that dream and I let it work its way through me. And eventually I had like my mom, like four weeks later, we had a, she called me or I, ca- I was on a walk and it was like, call your mom. And so I did. And I was like, Hey, like, what's up? Cause she was in it. She's deep in it. Cause I can imagine when some shifts in the family system, I mean, it, it sends off everyone's stuff to the surface. Yeah. Um, she was choosing to sit with it. And I had a conversation with her. I told her about the dream. I was like, yeah, mom. I was like, I had this really vivid dream. Like, what aren't you telling me? Like, there's more here. Like, and yeah. it's time. And she shared some truths that completely recontextualized my life. Recontextualized mm-hmm. the life her. Recontextualized everything. And mm. it was the first moment where I was like, one, I see you. Two, mm. think. Three, I'm sorry. Like it was like it w- like it makes me emotional. I haven't talked about this. Um, mm. It was the first time where I didn't see the I didn't see the result of the wounding. I saw the wounding, mm. and it was like, oh, that all makes sense. Thank you for supporting me in understanding all of this because now I can move into more compassion and we can move into more intimacy because we're not, we're not hiding things anymore. So that was a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Did, did you feel in that moment? Like that's when the, like you jumped, like, did you feel like the healing occur in that moment? And you're like, okay this is the healing I'm looking for. Yeah. 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 I mean, it it had occurred in pockets. Yeah. The rupture, because remember like when man is mother and that's the attachment that ruptures, what it really is rupturing, not only the connection with the partner, but it's also rupturing and making you examine your core relationship with mother. So for me, that was the descent. It was like actually to the core foundational blueprint of my attachment system, which is mm-hmm. why it's so terrifying to release it. Is it meant I had to go into it and grieve from the sense? I've never explained it in this way, but um, it was the death of all of my survival strategies, yeah. all of my identities that were still associated to that attachment bond that needed to dissolved that needed to be integrated that needed to be held um so yeah pocket for sure i remember i sent a boundary letter right after and i was like here are my boundaries and i was so fierce cammy i was like nobody will tell me this nobody like i and i was like very kind but like very clear like do not cross this line and my mom lover and i hadn't talked to her in like a year probably and be deeper Wow. with of course like here's support i was like <gasps> how dare you act so kind <laughs> it was just like and the, you know to be honest with you at that moment i didn't trust her i was like yeah. I don't trust that i was like you gotta earn my trust now yeah so luckily i mean you know there's so many things happening on all different layers of this human experience that luckily you know the seeds were planted and and it was, you know what it took? It took me standing in integrity with my truth of like, I will no longer tolerate this, 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 this with yeah. you, with men, with anyone. Mm. Like I've done all these codependent and mesh dynamics where I have to sell myself or I have to abandon myself in order to get my needs met or in order to, in order to have love. It's not, yeah. it's not love. Yeah. Yeah, it's so beautiful to hear you like illustrate how dedicated you are to your truth. Oh man, you know why? I, it kind of circles back to the beginning of the conversation. If I'm not my body, <laughs> I mean, literally, if I'm not, my body will completely <laughs> throw me. I mean, it'll let me know. If I step out of the line of my truth, it's actually to the extreme. Where if I step out of alignment with my truth or if I'm asleep to some dynamic that I need to like 
a deep unconscious and I move into something of that pattern or out of that survival strategy, my body goes into a full trauma response. Mm. Like full activation, full shaking. Like that's how deep it is for me. Like if that's why for me, it's actually a non-negotiable. I can't actually step out of alignment because I will be sick and I, mm. I don't want to be sick. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, you know, I work with people all the time and, you know, a lot of people can heal when they change their diet, but a lot of people it's deeper than that. And the diet is that, like you said, the entry point into other modalities and, and, you know, different ways that may be, uh, holding you back from healing. Right. And so it's, it's so interesting how the body speaks to you in so many ways. So many ways. Yeah. One of the biggest questions I get is how do you know the difference between trauma and intuition? Mm. And I'm like, okay, I wish it was that black and white. It's not. And yeah. um, to be honest with you, if your body's communicating it to you, it's for me, I privilege it as truth. Even mm. if it's coming from trauma, it's still true. Mm. There's a reason it's coming up. Yeah. Don't minimize it. Don't make it mean less than I've done that. It doesn't work. It's like, okay, let's bring it to the surface and acknowledge and witness this part or whatever is true in that moment. We have yeah. to validate yeah. our experience before we can even come out of it. So for all of you who are asking that question, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> I've been you. <laughs> I love that. That's a really good question. Um, so if people are resonating with what you're saying, what are some clear signs that like a no man container could be for you? Mm, there are signs. Um, you keep repeating the same patterns in relationships and choosing emotionally unavailable people. You recreate codependent dynamics. You um, feel unfulfilled. You feel like there's something blocking your ability to receive or say yes to deep partnership and love. Um, you have a mother wound and you need to examine your core relationship with mother and that attachment bond. Um, you might be coming into the awareness of how much you're sourcing external validation, safety and security, at the expense of self. And that's a pretty big point in time where you're like, okay, I, this is not actually going to work because I keep disconnecting and losing myself. Mm. And so if that's something that shows up for you, then, you know, I really, really think that this container is sacred and it's mm -hmm. deeper and it's not something that's just light. Um, because what you're doing when you say yes to this container is you are saying yes to healing the dynamic between your own masculine principle and feminine principle. And mm -hmm creating a state of union there and a really strong base and foundation to support you in, in standing deeper in your with the truth. Because at that point, when you know you're unconditionally okay on your own, mm -hmm. you're really free. Like, I know I'm okay. Like, so I'm not going to try to manage or control anything because I actually know and believe in my bones and myself that I am unconditionally okay no matter what happens around me. Mm. So I'm not moving from a space of um, fear mm. because I trust myself and I trust life. And a lot of healing mm. our relationship to trust is healing our relationship to mother mm. because mother was the original blueprint, the substrate in which we are created from and how we relate to mother and trusting life. It's like how we relate to trusting life, how we relate to trusting this human experience. Yeah. Else. So so that's a, that's another doorway in of like mm. how's that relationship looking, how much do I trust life? Mm. Do, I trust life? do I trust myself? And, and if you don't, then, then there might be something to explore there and go deeper in. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for that. Um, so you were in the man container, no man container for eight months. I was in the no container. I mean, the rupture happened in September, but it wasn't in the actual container until November. So one, uh, yeah, six months. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm like, oh, yeah. Gosh, felt 
decade? It was, it was crazy because um, at the time, Mark and Connor were um, in DC for um, something that Martin was putting on. And I remember we went to dinner with Mark and Mark like looked at me and was telling me that you guys broke up. And I was like, so sad. <laughs> like, oh, it was so hard to hear. And I was really excited to hear you guys got back together. And I, and like, tell me if this is normal, but it's not unusual. I mean, it's, it's unusual for someone to go through a huge breakup and then, you know, do a lot of processing and then come back together and be able to be back together. So can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Because I, I mean, I'm, I'm so happy you guys got back together and, um, you know, it's not always usual that two people can figure things out. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's something I got asked a lot in the reunion of like, how do I get back? And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. I'm like, please let's not create a pedestal around this dynamic. This is not something that, you know, what I said was walk with hope until it becomes true. Because mm -hmm. at some point in my no man diet container, I was so, so deeply integrated and in my truth that I remember saying to Mark, even in the reunion was like, I don't know what's supposed to happen in this container with me and you. I don't know if we're supposed to be friends. I don't know if we're supposed to be business. Like, I don't know. And I'm not attaching to it needs to look another way. And I'm released from the attachment. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes when we don't do enough of the processing work, because I was like, I'm not recreating that pattern. I'm not recreating any of it. Like, I don't want the same relational dynamic because that wasn't healthy for either of us. Like, yes, we loved each other deeply, but how it was expressing and showing up was not actually in service to either yeah. of us. And so we were at this point where we're like, I want you to be happy. I care about you more than anything. And so we have to sit with in our reunion. So we had a three month dating phase where it was like, we're not collapsing. This is why the whole world didn't know for five months. Cause we were yeah. like, we don't know. Like we're in the unknown of this. Like oh. are we is in highest and best alignment for us to move into sacred partnership again, or is it not? Mm. We didn't know. And so that was the question we asked ourselves and we said, okay, we'll revisit it at three months and check in with each other. And we checked in way, way more than that. But like, yeah. And then it was like, okay, it's September. Like, how do we feel? Like, are we ready to fully move into sacred partnership again? Does that feel in highest and best alignment? And for Mark and I, it has, and it did. And it invited us into, I mean, <laughs> oh, the reunion was so good. Um, <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't really, you can never actually put into words what it was like. Um, but it's not the same relationship. We're not the same people. Mm. Um, it's not even close. Mm. So I say that because that's the only way it can work because I've done so much work. Mark had done so much work that it needed to be a new relational dynamic or, or it was choosing a different path for us. Um, so th <laughs> that's where we started in that reunion process was like, what is true? What is an alignment? We weren't attached either way. We weren't forcing. Yeah. So now here we are, um, reunited almost, gosh, almost a year now, which is wild to think about because so much yeah. has happened in one year and it's so, oh, it's so easy. Like it's so much easier than our previous relational dynamic. We have so much more fun and we're in joy. And it's like mm -hmm. conflict because I'm connected to my anger. I'm connected to my boundaries. So we can actually have real conversations instead of me collapsing into like the little girl of like people pleasing and yeah. And it's like, no, I'm an adult. You're an adult. Yeah. We're okay. Unconditionally without each other. And we both knew, know that now. Mm. So, in our previous attachment dynamics, since we were both playing mother. Yeah. Son, mother, daughter dynamics, drama bonds. Um, I didn't actually think we were going to be okay without each other. Like it was mm -hmm. like that deep, or it was like, oh my gosh, yeah. if I lose my life, because that's the part that was attached. So yeah. if anything, our sacred commitment or contract on this planet has been to liberate ourselves both from our mm -hmm. historical 
attachment trauma and intergenerational trauma. And I think Mark and I have done not to say that we're fully healed and fully realized beings, but I, I think that we've done a lot of work to actually create a lot of capacity and space for us to have fun. Yeah. I love that. And just enjoy each other. So it feels really nice. I don't want to f- idealize that because it was still yeah. hard deep work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but now we're getting to a place where it's like, okay, the foundation is pretty solid. We're no longer in codependent dynamics. So it feels nice. I love that. It's like 2021 relationship goals are like liberating liberating yourself from your, from your trauma so that you can be together in alignment with your partner. <laughs> Seriously, I'm creating a course with Mark on it. Like, I'm like, listen, this is, this is yes. so important and it has to come from both sides. And I think, mm. I think I'm very blessed in that my partner is deep in the work, mm. obviously. Um, but I think this conversation needs to include the full relationship. Yeah, because it can't be one sided. It has to be both people committed, um, and and that'll look different in every relationship. What their role, step yeah. forward and adulting looks like. So, um, yes, I'm here for that intention for everybody on this planet. Please, yes. Um, maybe you guys can have a little section like at the end of the course where you play matchmaker with attendees. You know what? It's Mark has been. She, told this a lot. He's actually matched a lot of people, which is interesting and funny. Um, I'm so game for that. I think I would think we'd be pretty good. You would. Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. And then we'll appreciate the weddings and yes. there's our whole business model. Here we are. <laughs> this is our life's path. <laughs> you guys could have the dopest matchmaking surface. Like that, I like yeah. the idea. <laughs> Matchmaking services plus the counseling and or coaching side that supports yes. the couple and moving through all the stuff. And then, yeah. yeah, we're good. Oh my God. Like, hold on. That the world needs that. <laughs> the world does need that. I agree. Yeah. We'll see where it all goes. Mark and I are, we've been really feeling called to um, stewardship getting into right relationship with the land and reconnecting mm-hmm. to mother earth and um, yeah, really cultivating the masculine and feminine principles within ourselves and, and modeling that in a deeper, deeper, more sacred way um, as well as stepping into some leadership around that. Like what does that mm-hmm. actually look like to create community, to create relationships, to create lives that are in harmony with, with life. Yeah. Yeah, I love that because you guys, you live in, do you still live in Vancouver? We currently do. Um, okay. However, Vancouver is, or is closing soon. Oh. Love Vancouver, but time is complete in Vancouver. Mm. So well, we're on to our next adventure. We're in the unknown and the liminal about that. That's exciting because um, I know you two both love being in nature. Yeah, more than anything. Yeah. That's really the call home. It's like, how can we reconnect back to nature? Oh, I love it. Um, so when you when rage does come up, when anger does surface, how do you process that now versus before? I love you. <laughs> Segue. How do you deal with rage? Well, yeah. um, so Mark and I have agreements in our relationship, historically and even still, like we don't hide anything. Like we have a pretty low threshold for for stuffing pushing it into the shadow anymore. Um, so when I feel rage, which I have um, a lot actually in the last year um, is I name it. I'm like, I'm feeling so much rage. So I either, depending on what it is and what type of support I need in order to process it, it's either I bring it to sisterhood and I just like, mm-hmm. you know, or I say, I would like to clear some stuff. Like, do you have the capacity right now to like, just let me have and Mark's been really good actually, because a lot of the stuff that has come up in the last year is around like the exploitation and the degradation of the feminine, but also women. And I have a lot of anger. Well, well historic, like I've moved through a lot of anger, but yeah. Um, I asked him and he's like, okay, let's, let's, let's create a, let's go. Mm. So really safe space for me to like, process my rage because I was really angry. And it's like, okay, what else? Tell me more. Like, let's go. Like you just like, so again, this is what happens when you're, 
you have you have big spaces like this and you've done a lot of work and like this already in the therapist before and we've created this in in that safe container so we can actually now model it into our relationship and be like okay let's move into it what else and so um for me that's one way to like process it yeah. through um but for me too personally like when i feel rage and anger like i let it sit in my system like i feel it i move into it i i'm kind of like okay what's happening here i don't act from like a aggressive like rageful space ever yeah because it's like who's holding the rage is it the like three-year-old or mm -hmm. is it the woman who's like i can yeah. hold this and how can i bring it into an integrated place and communicate in a way that is ownership language um mm -hmm. liberatory is embodied and is very clear yeah i think when you get into shame blame and all of that is you're not getting anywhere. You're just recreating. Yeah. That there's nothing that doesn't do anything. So it's like, okay, what is the, yeah. what's the boundary? What's the like, Hey, I see this and you don't, and we need mm. to look at it, you know? Yeah. So I think we need to bring Mark on to talk about how I deal with, <laughs> I think he might have some other thoughts. No, I'm just kidding. No, no actually he's I would actually, love that. <laughs> so grateful for me because like you can see stuff and feel stuff that I can't. Yeah. Well, I like, mean that you continue to invite me forward. Yeah. But you can even hear the shift in Mark's like podcast and courses and everything. Like you've had such an impact on his view of the patriarchy and the feminine. And like, it's so nice to hear that shift. Not that he wasn't conscious of it before, but like he really brings that forth through his work now. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder where that came from. <laughs> I wonder why that's so strong in his work. Yeah, no, it's it's something that, you know, in our reunion was not negotiable. And he's actually yeah. gotten to a place and he said to me last week, and it was so beautiful. He's like, I'm here to advocate for the feminine. And I'm here mm -hmm. to, and I'm like, finally, like, not that, but I was just like, yes, this is the type of, like leadership and Matt, like they need, like, mm -hmm. because the inverted King archetype of like domination, control, competition has just wreaked havoc. Mm. Yeah. And hear a man be like, I'm here to advocate the feminine and, and within himself as well, because we all have the masculine and feminine within himself and within the collective. And I'm like, mm. with really true life, life. Yeah. You know, we don't make it about gender it's just life yeah i'm gonna advocate for life oh great because <laughs> we're not gonna live if we don't start <laughs> yeah not. yeah and your core value is to feel alive so that's really important if your partner is an advocate for that yes yes exactly there it is there's the link <laughs> you um, feel alive, so you better protect life yeah that's yeah so there we sure. go there we go um, so you i imagine you have a pretty um uh, you have a lot of rituals or self-care practices that you adhere to, to keep your energetic body clear and, um, just flowing. Can you share with the audience a few of those? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, gosh, I feel like I'm in such a, a space of evolution right now. It's so mm -hmm. interesting how fast things are moving. Um, for me though, I've been deeply called to sitting with tea. So mm -hmm. I sit in tea every single day um, in the tea spirit, which has been the most grounding and nourishing practice mm. I've ever, I've ever cultivated. It, it makes me cry thinking about it because it's mm. so intentional and it's so like, it's just reminding me of, of how everything is alive, but also just, how important having reverence and intention mm -hmm. is when we drink anything. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's cacao, tea, water. Like, can we show up with deep reverence? Mm -hmm. uh, so tea ceremony has been a really, really big piece of my life in the last five months or so. Um, I move my body a lot. I mm -hmm. like to be in nature. I like to move. Um, I take baths. I lay on the biomat. I, I really now I'm at a place where I just listen. Yeah. 
body need. Historically, I was a little more rigid with that because mm-hmm. I actually, because I was my nervous system was in such activation before mm-hmm. that it was like go 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 check the boxes, and now I have enough capacity to be like okay. Mm-hmm. What do we actually need? What is going to feel yeah. at this time? So for me, a lot of ceremony, new moon, um, full moon ceremony. I sit in ceremony with Mark all the time now. Um, mm. It's kind of cultivating that back into our lives within community as well. Um, with my sisterhood, with my family, like yeah. I now create environments where we sit intentionally. We have real conversations, but we do it in really beautiful ways. And, mm. and like, can we game night? Like shut yeah. up, the, remove the technology. Like let's pull a board game. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> sit on a fire. Like let's connect. I love that. Yeah, we forget <laughs> how how powerful putting the phone down can be. Let me tell you, you want to talk about attachment trauma? <laughs> technology? No, that's for real. Like lack of attunement <laughs> that exists in our relationships at this time is grief inducing. Mm. there's no presence because we're so addicted that <sighs> it's like, I might be telling you something or I might be feeling something, but you're so here that you're not even attuned. And so yeah. what I'm picking up and what my system is, is rejection and they don't care mm-hmm. about me, right? Those things can build over time, but it's like, so that's again, how do we create an environment that supports us in getting these needs met? We say, okay, well for dinner, there's no, no phones or yeah. for an hour at night or for this, like, I would like to shut off the Wi-Fi. I'd like to drop mm. in. And that's a vulnerable place for a lot of people. Yeah. People actually have to have conversations. Absolutely. You know, I always appreciate that about you. You're like, I feel like you wouldn't do something unless you, unless you feel aligned to do it. And that goes for like doing a podcast or needing to take time off. And it's such, it's so expansive for me to hear because it reminds me to, step into the feminine and really listen to what my body's telling me. Crucial. Not easy to do in this system, but crucial. As yeah. you know, we've talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. Listening, listening. And that's, again, that's trusting. That's trust. Do you trust that if you listen and slow down and take space that you'll be supported? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. It's magic. <laughs> Real and life. I realize there's elements of privilege in this conversation when it comes to that, because my base needs are met mm-hmm. and I've had to work hard to build a foundation to meet those base needs. But, but, but again, this is not just self. And I think mm-hmm. so much of our world is self, self, self. I'm, I'm really trying to figure out and bridge. How do we create culture in a way where we start to honor the importance of community mm-hmm. we rely on one another again? Because yeah. in our current system, there's, you know, it's hyper individuality. Yeah. If you're a failure, if you can't take care of everything on your own, it's like, that's ridiculous. Like we have yeah. to, we got to figure out something else. Cause that's not working for us. This nuclear yeah. family system is working for us. Um, totally. just, they're outdated. They're not, they're not in service to humanity. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I even think about that, like living alone during a global pandemic, it's like, it's hard not to be around people. It's hard not to be in community. And yeah, I mean, you get it over the the computer, but it's, it's not the same and physical touch and, and being around another human is so important. So important. It's everything. I mean, we yeah. have connection. Yeah. So the impact of this, you know, epidemic or you know, pandemic is, it's really, um, I have such deep empathy for, for those who aren't in community and connection at this time in a way that yeah. feels nourishing and human touch is your, like you're saying, it's a very real thing. And to not have that human touch, it's like, um, it, it, it definitely plays a role in our overall well being. And so, you know, you're hoping that as you realize the impact of this, that we step into remembrance around, okay, how do I want to cultivate my life moving forward? Yeah. Because I don't, I don't, I don't want to live in this way. So obviously there's, there's layers to this conversation, but for yeah. me, it's like, how do I cultivate community and how do I start to live in right relationship with land? Mm. Because I don't want to do this alone. I don't, yeah. alone. I don't want like, nope. 
I'm no longer choosing that. I want to choose community, soul, family, and family. I'm looking at my family's support mm. and, and on the ride. But um, there are so many beautiful places on this planet that have cultivated really beautiful communities. And yeah. Well, are you a market to start a commune? Because I'll join. <sighs> Not at this time. Um, <laughs> we have a family commune coming, but we're... I think eventually we'll move into not the commune. I don't know. Yes, it'll be something different. It'll just be community. Yeah, yeah. But yes, you're more than welcome. We would I be happy. That. I love that. Um, well, thank you, Kylie, so much for for taking the time to talk with us today. You are amazing. I love speaking with you, and I feel like it's such a gift to have you on. Thanks, Cammie. It's, it's so much fun. You asked really beautiful questions that I haven't answered before. And I'm like, oh, there's that piece and that piece. So oh, thank what? you for creating such a beautiful space to have this conversation. Yeah. Right? You know, in this community. Yeah. Well, where, where can people um, stay in touch with you? And, and um, if people do want to embark on a no man container, are you still offering um, uh, the container for, for, for people or, or is there another way they can work with you? Yeah, so clients um, begin focusing all of my energy and my mentors container for remembrance, which is a nine month um, healing and awakening journey for women over nine months, which does include elements of the no man diet container, um, as well as anchored a three month offering, which is more specific to healing the inner masculine, inner feminine through okay. creating these really clear intentional containers. Um, and then the best way to get in touch with me is, is beautiful on Instagram. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, it was so nice talking with you, Kylie. Um, and I look forward to staying connected. Me too. Have a beautiful rest of your day.